Hello, good morning and a very warm welcome to you all. Um, it's super to see you here and a special hello to the Mayor of Camden who's also making a special visit. Good morning. My name is Farah and I'm the Marketing and Communications Leader for Buildings London. And so to our speaker this morning, Stephen's parents were Dutch. His mother was from Holland and his father from the Dutch Indies. They moved to England in the 1960s to start a new life. Born in Guildford, Stephen was influenced by Dutch art, architecture, sculptures, and at a young age travelled to Paris, Vienna and Milan simply to soak up the world of design. Studying art, graphical communication and geography A-levels, Stephen attended Epsom Art and Design College. He then went on to study a degree in product design at Brunel University. Much to his surprise, at Stephen's degree show, a manufacturer picked up one of his products and invited him to design a rechargeable bike torch. From the money Stephen made at a relatively young age, he set up a workshop and studio. From then on, Stephen designed and manufactured products, including objects for Conran and heels just across the road from here. Stephen was also commissioned by manufacturers to design products such as phones, lighting and kitchen appliances. Fast forward a decade to his 30s, Stephen had become a design director for an office manufacturer. And one day he happened to be walking past our offices and through our window saw a showcase of Arab's materials and product design work. He thought, what a fantastic opportunity, and after carrying out some fact-finding research, spoke to one of our facade engineers who gave him the relevant contacts here whom to write to. After a few interviews, Stephen was offered a job. Stephen's been here for almost 10 years now, and during this time, he's created an impressive portfolio of products, including low-energy lighting for Zumtabel and Iguzini. His projects also include the Sound Portal Pavilion at Trafalgar Square as part of London Design Festival. He's currently designing seating for Celex, a Spanish manufacturer, and a range of upcycled products with the Crown Estate. One of Stephen's instructions is also to develop comfortable train seats for all of the UK trains, which I have to admit I find rather bemusing given I struggle to find a seat every morning from Reading to Paddington on my daily commute. <laughs> Stephen also collaborates with architects such as Thomas Heatherwick and developer Stan Hope. He's also the author of The Industrial Resolution, a book that explores closed loop design and manufacturing. And on that note, I'm very happy to introduce the lovely and talented Stephen Phillips, who will share his thinking on the sweet spot of design. Thank you, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us, and thanks very much, Farah. As a product designer, I enjoy working on a range of challenging projects that solve problems, often on an industrial scale. For me, architecture, product design and sculpture are close cousins because they are related three-dimensional activities. They also have a profound influence on people, both in a physical and psychological sense. So, based on my experiences so far, I'm going to share my thoughts on design and that all too rare sweet spot of design. Bruno Minari was among the most influential multidisciplinary designers of all time, described by Picasso as the new Leonardo. In his pivotal book, Design as Art, Minari insisted that design, like art, should be beautiful, functional, accessible and visionary. He also believed that design has the ability to be an art for the masses, something that people could use and take pleasure in. We understand that sculptural three-dimensional form carries strong symbolism. This has the power to convey our ideas, hopes and dreams. The simplicity of Constantin Brancusi's fish is an emblem of the beauty and efficiency of the natural world. Brancusi commanded a mastery of materials and he used them with assurance to create a sculpture. The simple hydrodynamic essence of a fish 
implies a confidence in new technology, speed, design and materials that reflected that roaring 1920s window of optimism. Volkswagen camper vans have rarely been so popular because of the almost tribal nomadic lifestyle associated with these vehicles. For owners who have followed the surf, this lifestyle is a reality. Yet for others who have grown up and started a family, with all the responsibilities that go with that, perhaps ownership represents a statement of their former life. It helps us to realise how useful things are attractive to us and the importance of demonstrating our tribal values, hopes and aspirations to our peers. Like many of you, I've been lucky enough to design physical things for a living. It's a process that's tremendously enjoyable and with 30 years experience under my belt, it's clear that to achieve the sweet spot of design, it's better if there is an understanding in how to get there with a client who shares a design vision. I believe to hit the sweet spot of design, there is an alignment of beauty and function where the end result not only satisfies us, it is attractive and useful to people in the wider world. At university, I was making a one-off prototype light. My professor said, anyone can design and make a prototype product. There's nothing that challenging about it. Creating a useful object to be selected, used and enjoyed by hundreds of thousands of people that necessitates the need to use industrial manufacturing and assembly techniques, now that's a real challenge. Product designers are in a privileged or precarious position as the success of design can easily be measured. At face value, you can tell when the balance has been achieved by measuring cold sales. For example, the enduring legacy and appeal of high-end products. Unlike buildings, which are always complex prototypes. Product designers are able to make and refine a number of pre-production prototypes behind closed doors before the public are even aware of a new concept. After launching a product, market success provides an indicator that people have selected to invest, use and enjoy your products over others. Mm -hmm. However, it's only when the customer comes back for more, <coughs> demonstrating brand loyalty, that you know you've achieved a certain success as people have gained satisfaction and trust in the design. Yet surely achieving the sweet spot of design is more than just exceeding sales targets, has more depth than the vagaries of brand loyalty and unique selling points. Of course it does, and it isn't achieved very often. My degree was centered in the design studio and workshop. I chose a course that had a mini factory on the ground floor. So fitting around the important exercise of designing and making things in as many materials as I could get my hands on using a range of production and making processes was fundamental to my development. My thesis at the time centered around chair design. Chairs are a personal obsession. I argued that like buildings, seats are as much a symbol as a functional object. Paul Branton's seminal research paper, An Evaluation of Seats by Observation of Sitting Behavior, written in 1969 for the General Medical Council, stated rather bizarrely, Upon filming 18 subjects sitting in chairs over the course of five hours speeding up the film, we observed the chair would systematically eject the sitter from the seat. <laughs> it goes to show how much a chair is about our ideas and values as about sitting. Our ancestors created tools, shelter, containers and jewellery since 3.3 million years ago yet we can assume they didn't use the word design to describe their activities. The first stone cutting and spearing tools were found in Olduvai Gorge in the eastern Serengeti plain. They were not only useful, but elegant. The makers took considerable time and effort to nap the tools to be symmetrical, tapered and slender, as well as useful. Perhaps our ancestors' brains were neurologically similar to ours in that useful tools had to look right to ensure the user felt some subconscious pride in making, owning and using them. During the next three million years, small refinements to the tools' designs grew their tool repertoire for different purposes. This allowed them to thrive in their immediate environment and migrate. As the Neolithic population increased and settled between 10,000 and 3,000 BC, 
pottery developed in the Far, Middle and Near East. Some examples of the first dwellings with built-in furniture survive at Skara Bray on the Orkney Islands. They demonstrate a level of settlement, human development and object shapes way above subsistence level. Naturally, these items were precious and made with some considerable skill. They were technically advanced for the time. These useful objects must have brought the maker and user some emotional pleasure, pride of ownership and social status within the group. Advances in metallurgical technologies resulted in the Bronze and Iron Ages and more recently the Bessemer steelmaking process. This alone resulted in many of the important developments seen during the Industrial Revolution through to today. The word design was first used in the 1540s from the Latin word designare to mark out, devise, choose, designate and appoint. The word may have been used to describe some of the human decision-making processes needed to achieve the range of vernacular building and object styles developed by people in response to how they lived. Decisions were made as much to communicate their desires and beliefs as to providing shelter and physical comfort. This led to a richness of different building and object styles across the world. With a greater movement of people and trade, designs were distilled across different geographical locations and cultures. There was a significant influence from China and the Middle East, which slowly transcended west into Europe. Between the beginning of the 16th and end of the 19th century, Baroque, Classicism, Revivalism, Art Nouveau and Art Deco were just some of the prevalent building styles. It was during the 20th century that design was used to describe the activity we were familiar with today. During the early 20th century, modernist architecture practiced by Walter Gropius, Le Corbusier and Marcel Breuer addressed what beauty, function and design could be. One of my heroes, the product designer Kenneth Grange, reflected on the term designer during a recent discussion. Now, Kenneth was born in 1929. In his 20s, he worked as an architectural assistant for the architect Jack Howie. Howie had worked for the founder of the Bauhaus, Walter Gropius, during Walter's three-year stay in London before moving to the US in 1937. Gropius's teachings and geographical movements had a big influence on the cross-cultural take-up of modernism, resulting in buildings, fittings and furniture of a unified modernist language that strived for a utopian vision. Clearly, Kenneth was one of many who absorbed and responded to the modernist zeitgeist. Setting up his own design company in 1958 and meeting our founder, Ove Arup, along the way. He explored and explained how the modern use of the word design became broader from the one that he grew up with. Even in the office of an architect in the 1950s, we rarely use the term. Design grew out of architecture and architects engaging with products that contribute to a building's aesthetic. His vast and unique portfolio included British Rail's high-speed train, known as the InterCity 125, most of London's bus shelters, the TX1 black taxi cab, pens for Parker, and the first Kenwood Chef food processor. Architects such as Arne Jakobsen reinterpreted modernism and enabled the design intent to be softer, warmer, and more intimate. <coughs> Charles and Ray Eames also responded to modernism and their cultural surroundings. Modern buildings and the items within strive to be more humane or people-centered with a team of multidisciplinary specialists contributing to the project. In the early 20th century, Sigmund Freud, the Austrian neurologist and founder of psychoanalysis, gained a new understanding of psychoanalytical theory. Yet, it was the magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI scan, used for the first time in 1970 that objectively mapped neurological activity of the central nervous system. In the past 15 years, neuroimaging has opened up the door to direct observation of our cognitive activities. So, what happens in the first few seconds when we see a new object or thing? It is now widely accepted that people can experience comfort, excitement, pleasure, and confidence when looking at and appraising something desirable for the first time. 
On the other hand, feelings of mistrust, anxiety and discomfort can just as easily occur. These experiences vary from person to person, but to hit that nirvana, the design needs to achieve positive emotional responses. They happen subconsciously within a few seconds or so of encountering a new object. Only after this, once the person has experienced their first impression, will they consider performance and value. This is how it works. When viewing an object, we use our eyes. The optic nerve sends an impulse from the retina to the amygdala in the brain. The amygdala reacts quickly and emotionally to the object. At best, a reaction of excitement and pleasure. At worst, fear and mistrust. A secondary instantaneous impulse from the cingulate gyrus in the front of the brain informs our next reaction to the building, sculpture or object, based on our past experiences. This can explain why people feel comfortable with certain characteristics and shapes and less comfortable with others. For instance, users understand immediately that a chair made from wood with four legs works. Whereas a seat of sheet glass induces fear sometimes, as the user is familiar with the cold brittleness of glass and the harm it causes should it break. Finally, our dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the frontal lobes, responsible for the analytical thinking or logic, helps us to consider how it works or product performance. And finally, how much does it cost and what's the environmental impact? If the design has catered for all these emotional demands and achieved the rational functional needs, how much does it cost is relatively trivial because you've already made up your mind, I must have it. The neurological workings of our brain helps us to understand what happens to people when they look at, consider and use things that are in tune with our psychological and survival needs. To hit the sweet spot, a design should look right, work beautifully and contain other subtle yet important characteristics as well. Should design respond to the current zeitgeist and represent our future aspirations? Annual design and architecture events like the Venice Biennale and London Design Festival offer architects and designers the opportunity to explore, respond to and communicate current ideas and beliefs. Design is about our aspirations for a better future, one that's more in tune with people and the planet. Brave new cultural buildings such as the National Library of Qatar integrate a variety of collaborative and individual learning spaces which include a children's library, a young adult collection, computer labs, digital media, production facilities, and performance spaces. It demonstrates the desire to invest in design and provide inspiring cultural centers for future generations. Other building projects, such as the Royal Academy Extension by David Chipperfield Architects, responds to and enhance existing buildings. The Royal Academy's diagnostic remodelling adds new galleries, a lecture theatre, education space, a cafe bar and space for the Academy's art schools. Charles Samaris Smith, the RA's CEO, says the aim of this is to take this vulnerable institution and bring it back to what it's supposed to be, an academy. We use and surround ourselves with a plethora of objects in our everyday lives, some of which we exercise personal choice the house we live in, the car we drive, and somewhere we have no choice, the train we board or the office we work in. In our design-led world, what are the considerations of this imaginative yet challenging process? It has to look right. An object can be so beautiful that it takes the air from the room or just very satisfying to look at and account for people's familiarity with a classic shape. Chairmakers have refined seats for 5,000 years to reflect their time. During the past 25 years, the industrial design trio Liavori, Althea and Molina concentrated and refined the textbook chair to its essential form. And like many other organisations, we at Arup use their Katifa 46 chairs every day. I'm not a big fan of co-moulded plastics because they are almost <coughs> impossible to separate and recycle. But speaking as a chair fanatic, this simple, rather familiar seat brings a lot of pleasure when gazing on its sinuous lines and leaning back, feeling the way it flexes and moves. 
I appreciate the time, effort and experience that has resulted in such a refined form. It's clearly a fantastic chair. I can almost forgive the co-moulding because it provides a volume of fresh colour and raises the value of plastic from a sack of low value granules into a thing of beauty and simplicity. It fits squarely into the safe archetypal product category because this chair's quintessential form with four legs, a seat and a back can be traced back to seats of ancient Egypt. For me, it achieves the sweet spot of design on a number of levels. Other refined prototypical products are surefire winners, such as Eric Magnusson's <coughs> vacuum jug for Stelton, the shape of which hasn't changed much since clay water jugs from 2000 BC. And more recently, the new TX London Taxi. All are a result of design evolution, an entirely natural, almost Darwinian approach to conceiving new products. Updating a classic such as the Fiat 500, or the German Hasselblad professional film camera into digital are surefire commercial winners, but sometimes these new designs referencing old are too literal and we need something groundbreaking. Perfection every time. People trust and have loyalty in something that just works beautifully long term. We can all think of occasions where the way it works is an afterthought. Items with a strong visual statement on a sculptural level but disappointing when used. After an initial high, dripping orange juice over the kitchen counter or burning your hands on the metal handle of your kettle brings danger and disappointment to the user. <laughs> Clearly these objects are not really intended for use. They are for show and as such don't fit in the kitchen drawers. We all use tools to conduct our everyday lives and the sharper they are and the better they work, the less we have to worry about them. <laughs> Appliances, Vehicles and buildings, the things that work beautifully are the ones that bring us long-term satisfaction. After considering writing and publishing articles on the subject of design in the Milanese paper Il Giorno for much of his life, Bruno Minari came to the following conclusions. Anyone working in the field of design has a hard task ahead of them. To clear their neighbour's mind of all preconceived notions of art and artists Notions picked up at schools where they condition you to think one way for the whole of your life without stopping to think that life changes, and today more than ever. Designers need to give the right weight to each part of the project in hand, and they know the ultimate form of the object is psychologically vital when the potential user is making up their mind. They try to give it a form as appropriate as possible to its function, from the mechanical part, where there is one, from the most appropriate material, from the most up-to-date production techniques, and the calculation of costs, from a psychological uh, and sustainability point of view. Ovarup's <coughs> philosophy of total design, engineers working in parallel with visionary architects and designers, is a great basis to achieve Minari's vision. Our founder and our colleagues today continue to demonstrate a blurring of traditional engineering and design roles. I'm very happy to say that Ove spent eight years designing a chess set, including the instructions and packaging. Minari also wrote, an engineer should never be caught writing poetry. There are many exceptions to that tongue-in-cheek remark as demonstrated by Ove's poems, drawings and philosophy. But perhaps it shows the importance of embracing those pursuits, of being open to a wider perspective and response to the world's challenges. Thank you. So do we have any, uh, any questions on that? Jeff Taylor, um, Farnsworth House, Mies van der Rohe, uh, a triumph of uh, form over function. Uh, would you say that um, uh, a product that is, is due for mass production, if it's badly designed, is almost going to fail without question? How is it then that um, a one-off failure is allowed to, to, to come into life? Well, the products that you're thinking of in that, in that house, Mies van der Rohe's chairs, um, yeah, I can think of those and they're, they're shapes that are not 
that great for the human body, I must say. And the house. Yeah, they... Um, Single glazing in a Chicago climate. Yes, yeah. So, uh, you know, it's a beautiful thing to look at. It is a piece of beauty and it has, you know, again, Mies was probably a master of materials. But um, you're right, maybe it's a design that was uh, maybe a touch of ahead of its time, but it looked beautiful. Um, and then it's when people live in the house that maybe the disappointment could kick in. Um, the nice thing is today we know about those uh, shortcomings and we can accommodate them in the, in the design. So we have double glazing, triple glazing, uh, we can worry about the thermal conductivity through the facade, those sorts of things. And yeah, it's, we, you learn from mistakes, I would say. <laughs> Steve, uh, Graham Dodge from Power Up. Thank you, Steve. Um, reflecting that last, that last question, you, you've talked about, uh, about design of products and of, and of architecture. How do you think in, in the built environment we can, we can learn from the product design area? Because from, for me, the big distinction between the two areas is in architecture, the product is sold before it's, before it's uh, designed, let alone built. Uh, whereas in, in most products, they are designed and prototyped, as you, as you described, long before they're sold. What can, we, what can we learn one from the other? Yeah, well, um, I was talking to a colleague um, in the audience earlier about this, and um, it's actually, we, we're very lucky because now we can model buildings um, very accurately, which um, actually speeds up the whole process immensely. Um, and from there, we can actually look for potential problems further down the line. But I think it often comes back to the more the more physical prototyping you can do to resolve the issues um, before it's built, the better. The, the more likely it is to actually um, achieve the designer's vision and work on day one. Um, prefabrication, you know, we all know that if you can do a lot of prefabrication off-site in a factory um, where it can, you know, connections can be pre-assembled, that really helps as well. So, I think um, in, in product design, you can prototype things. They always say three times, and then the next one will go right. With buildings, you don't get that luxury. But I would say the more prototyping you can do, and modeling, and then a review of that, plus the designer, the architect, uh, the engineer, working together from day one as I've uh, envisaged, that's, that's always the way to get rid of these problems. Yeah. Um, if you had to put a product in a time capsule to be discovered, say in a thousand years time, what would you Ooh, put in and why? Yeah. Grief. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, I guess um, in a thousand years time, something that represents the moment. Ooh, I would say there were a number of products on one of my slides which showed the you know, the, it would have to be a very large capsule for a start. So it would have, uh, the Heathrow um, self-driving pods are amazing. I think they work beautifully well. Um, so I'd have one of those in a very large. I think our, our, um, our Stelton kettle outside, actually it's a great design. Uh, we just use them all day to day without thinking about it. It's a great reflection of our time and it works beautifully. Um, you may be, um, you know, that, there it is, the one on the, the left there. Um, we would obviously include communication and digital uh, communication these days is, you know, it's, it's how we all communicate. I would, um, now thinking about tribal values, I would put in a Samsung and an Apple phone in the box <laughs> as well. <laughs> so, so I'm on the fence there in terms of um, phone tribes. So probably those sort of things. Yeah. Hi, Julie Oh, hi, Julie. Done some work so you've done some circular economy. Yes. And I'm just wondering um, how you think, in a very quick summary, we can get more traction on circular economy given some of the things you've been talking about. Today. Yes, um, that's a really good question. And um, what we're talking about is um, closed loop design, how to make things that are closed loop, that they can be reused, reharvested at, at end of life, and also products that can be made from waste material. And um, one thing I've, I've learned over recent, recent times is um, if, even if a product is sustainable, it still has to look beautiful and work beautifully. 
Um, and that's actually another challenge for designers and architects as well, is to consider how can we make things the way we do now to make sure they work well, they work beautifully and they look great, but also how are they going to be dealt with at, at the end of life. Um, and we have experimented a bit on, on that, of course, using waste material, turning them into new products. Um, it's something I've explored in the book that Farah just mentioned, um, The Industrial <laughs> Resolution. I will give you a copy. <laughs> yes, and, uh, complex subjects, but I'll, um, it, it's all written in there, and it's, it's, it sort of talks about vehicles and products and buildings and those sort of categories. So um, I think... I think that it's a new challenge and, and we need to still think about how things look and how they work, but then also how, how do you deal with the materials at end of life and how can you refurbish things easier. Yeah. We're, we're obviously going into an era of more digital and, and less practical things, like less material things. Um, yes. How do you see the evolution of the product designer role into in, in this? Well, it's. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's certainly becoming even more multidisciplinary because um, with digital evolution, of course, what we, uh, what we increasingly look at is the digital interface, the software, um, the hardware, and also how, how, do all, how does the functionality of a screen work? So what's the user experience or behind um, the function of a, of a telephone, for instance, or a computer? Um, and in that respect, we're working much more with UX designers, user experience designers, purely on the, um, on the functionality of the, of the screen and the functions behind that, the digital functionality. So it's becoming even more multidisciplinary as, as a product design subject. Yeah, it's interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Right, you mentioned that some part desires art. So is there any desire to remove the fact that human completely? Um, remove the human completely? No, I, I think actually, well, it's, it's interesting. I, I think it's from uh, putting this talk together, I, I found we're at a point where we understand humans better. Um, so looking at the, uh, the mapping of the brain, for instance, it's only recently we can start to see what are people, what happens in the brain when people look at things for the first time. And what it shows is, um, first of all, that we're all different. But there is some commonality over the experience that we're expecting in a, in a design, the way it looks and the way it works. So we can design things around that, um, that common view in a way. So um, what I mean is by, um, sorry Graham, is not designing a chair that's made of glass because we know that people are going to expect it to break. So, so I think actually it's being more in tune with um, people. Uh, I think that's the way we need to move forward, especially with... Um, you know, really uh, kind of, you know, this, uh, this whole approach of um, digital design, I guess. Um, that's the way to. hope that answers your question. Oh, yes. The train seats, is there anything else in, in the world you think desperately needs a redesign? Oh, train seats really are a big one. Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> that is uh, funny. Yes, I'm working with Levents here on train seats, and um, they are. They're, they're something that, that, I'll tell you what, on trains actually the big, big question at the moment is um, capacity of course. And okay, you can design a more comfortable train seat, but we also worry, have to worry about how do we address capacity where there's more people in the world today having to get in backwards and forwards to work. Um, and you know the rush hour, the trains, trains are, are so busy. So how do actually we, do, we deal with that, with standing people? How do we get people in and out of the station quicker um, and, and to give them a much better experience? So I think trains and train seats are such a big topic at the moment. The other one, of course, is closed loop design. That's, that's without a doubt, that's um, way more important these days. I thought this morning's talk was absolutely interesting and fantastic. I think you know, designers have a great challenge in you know, bringing people together and I think you know, the most important aspect of this is really you know, how we respond to you know, design and how you know, the impact on the human you know, is. So I think the great challenge of you know, designers is really to try and bring people together and I think the people element is what transcends everything, so you know, it's the human uh, aspect of it that bring us all together in design really.
I think it's a constant, um, you know, evolving process, you know, in terms of product design because, you know, people continuously change, culture continuously change, so also design needs to respond to, you know, this huge, you know, demand that is, you know, what, you know, people need to improve their lives through, you know, products, through new ideas, through arts and culture, and I think it's such a broad aspect that, you know, touches a little bit, you know, everyone and everything. I think the talk this morning was amazing and very informative and uh, yeah, just fabulous. Um, in terms of uh, design shaping our world, actually it's funny that people don't realize how much design has an impact on their life, but they use it every day and they use the building, the coffee machine, the car. Um, and it's just great as a designer, in my case as an architect, to see how my work can change their life or make it better or improve it in a certain way. And I think his talk uh, illustrated in a very uh, good way, showing just a simple cafe pot be used every day in an Arup company where you don't really realize it, but you have got a nice project which makes your life easier. I thought Stephen's talk was great. It was really great the way he kind of provided a history of design and about the relationship between all the different um, disciplines. And I think that when you're a young person and you're trying to decide on subjects or what to do at university, you have to make a decision and you have to go on a very kind of small kind of route. But actually, as he kind of outlined today, it's all connected. And obviously from the work that I do at the Victorian Albert Museum and when I work with people like from Arup or architects or even performers and we're designing experiences for families, we have to think about everything from how it looks to how people will engage and interact, how long it will take to kind of understand the idea and, and putting something together as well as um, how it feels, how you're going to kind of dispose of it when you've finished with your product or your performance and it's all linked um, and I think that it was really interesting for me because coming from an art historical background to understand this idea and really think about how architecture you do it obviously you do prototyping and model making but then you do it once and it's there whereas certainly product design you can refine and do it again and again so that's just really interesting for me to kind of reflect on broader ideas that he was exploring.